slightly disappointed. Good morning, everyone. Our guests have now arrived, made their way from the airport, and I, I think the biggest challenge was getting into the Woodrow Wilson Center, not getting through the airport. So, <laughs> uh, so we're very happy to have them uh, on board. Uh, let me welcome you this morning uh, on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center, on behalf of Lee Hamilton, our president. Uh, as you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center is, uh, is the living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson uh, and uh, the whole uh, he's, he's, he's the only president to ever have a Ph.D. and to be a true academic uh, president of Princeton, as you all know. And so he very much cared about the intersection of, of ideas and policy makers and uh, those who, uh, who are experts in the field. And, and that's what the center tries to do, bring people together to, to look at issues and, and, and speak with people who are experts on it. And we often do what we're doing today, and that is when there's a book of a particular interest that's come out on a subject, to have that book uh, introduced and uh, have some people who are associated associated with that book, uh, 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 speak to it, and then open it up to, for discussion. Uh, I don't know how many of you had a chance to, to, uh, to read the, uh, the uh, volume we're talking about. It's Eritrea's External Relations, Understanding Its Regional Role in Foreign Policy. Richard Reed, who is the editor, uh, is going to be our first speaker. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he uh, will be speaking about the book and some of the issues that it brings up. Um, he also has brought some copies of the book, which are out on the desk there, which I think you can uh, talk to him about uh, obtaining. Um, we, uh, we then have asked uh, uh, Dr. Barakat uh, Habt Selassie, uh, who's out of the University of North Carolina, uh, to make a response uh, to, uh, to Richard's um, uh, presentation. Um, we would uh, then be opening it up. We hope to do that in about 30 minutes. Uh, we have to be out of here by 11 o'clock, so we hope to have a good half an hour or 40 minutes, hopefully, of uh, question and answers and some interaction with the, uh, with the audience. Um, I don't think I really need to do much introduction. You have uh, bios before you of, uh, of both uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Selassie. Uh, Richard, of course, is at uh, SOAS uh, in London, uh, which is my old alma mater, so I'm pleased to see him. Uh, he's been uh, long involved in writing about uh, uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, and Dr. Selassie, as well known to you, uh, is currently professor of African Studies and professor at law at the University of North Carolina, but served as the chair of the Constitutional Commission in Eritrea in the 90s and was attorney general in Ethiopia in the 1960s. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, ask Richard to come up and, uh, and start our work. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and a rare honor to be able to speak about uh, Eritrea, uh, which often gets a little bit of attention, uh, but often for the wrong reasons. And in fact, of course, one of the reasons I'm here um, in the US is possibly for the wrong reason, uh, which is a fairly negative reportage of Eritrea. Um, it'll be clear enough uh, to many of you in this room um, that in recent weeks the issue of Eritrea's external relations uh, has never been more important and indeed is now a matter of some urgency. Uh, just before Christmas, uh, the United Nations uh, Security Council formally imposed sanctions on Eritrea as punishment for the latter's alleged support for the Somali uh, insurgents, making it the first country uh, to be subjected to sanctions, of course, since Iran in 2006. Eritrea's isolation is therefore deepening um, as we speak, and in a sense, its isolation has almost come full circle uh, since the era of the liberation struggle in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, as a noteworthy aside, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, just as the story uh, on Eritrea UN sanctions was doing the rounds before Christmas, another story on the horn uh, was current, namely the senten sentencing to death in Ethiopia of several dissident politicians uh, for plotting to overthrow the government, again, um, allegedly. And it kind of encapsulates Eritrea's problem, uh, its dilemma, because while the situation in Ethiopia um, is also a cause for some concern in human rights and policy circles um, as the government, Ethiopian government closes down the political space, has some dodgy local wars, including in Somalia. Ethiopia, nonetheless, seems to uh, win uh, the plaudits, repeatedly, of the Western governments that matter, whereas Eritrea is routinely uh, punished and um, uh, criticized. Eritrea has become the region's spoiler. Uh, Ethiopia, uh, however, remains favored. Um, I suppose the key question that the book 
uh, that we're launching here um, seeks to uh, pose is how has this come about? What has Ethiopia done right and what has Eritrea done wrong? Uh, it may simply be a matter of uh, Ethiopia being cleverer than Eritrea, uh, which would not, in fact, be the first time, perhaps, that that's happened. Whatever the case, um, it's worth noting how uh, far and how quickly Eritrea has fallen uh, since the late 1980s, early 1990s, when it was something of a cause celeb, um, openly admired by those who knew the movement, the EPLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, during the, the Liberation War. And it's fair to say that many a platonic love affair blossomed between EPLF guerrilla and Western scholar, um, Many who knew the movement, admired it uh, openly, uh, believed it was uh, the future um, of, of the Horn. Um, so it is proved, but not quite in the way that uh, was planned. Eritrea has fallen from being feisty young nation to penalised regional irritant, and this has uh, happened in a little under 20 years. Just a word on um, the book itself. Uh, its background... Um, is in the Horn of Africa group at Chatham House uh, in London, headed by uh, Sally Healy, who will be known to some of you, who's formerly of the UK Foreign Office and now a fellow at Chatham House. And we have been dealing with a series of issues that are relevant to the Horn. One of these was Eritrea's external relations. And the original workshop was held in December 2007, and we've been doing work subsequent to that. And... Uh, uh, tapping the expertise of a number of uh, practitioners and academics, and the outcome is the current uh, volume. The contributors, I hope, no, uh, no real, uh, needs uh, no real introduction. Uh, as editor, uh, I'm a historian, so I'm always trying to historicise things, uh, much to the irritation of some of my more contemporary-minded colleagues. Um, but my own introduction attempts to place uh, Eritrea's uh, relations in a deeper uh, perspective. Um, because the past matters in the Horn of Africa, which is one of the uh, crucial points that I think is often missed. It matters profoundly. Uh, Dan Connell, um, I'm happy to say, has contributed two essays to the uh, collection, one dealing with the uh, political culture of the EPLF, uh, which spills out into foreign policy, and one looking specifically at the relations between Eritrea and the United States, something I'll come back to in just a few moments uh, Kandani, Kandani Mengistab uh, brings together a number uh, of factors and dynamics shaping Eritrea's foreign relations during the 1990s. Um, we also have Gaim Kibrab, uh, who's a very well-known uh, scholar in London, who deals with um, the often under-examined question of Eritrean Sudan uh, relations. Uh, uh, Redi uh, Berketab uh, offers an in-depth examination of the 98 to 2000 war. Uh, and the Algiers Agreement. Every war, of course, is also a foreign policy event and uh, Reddy uh, attempts to study the war in that, in that way. And finally, Sally Healy herself uh, offers some reflections on the practice of diplomacy in the Horn of Africa. Uh, the basics of the story uh, of Eritrea's foreign relations over the past two decades are well known to most uh, of you, perhaps, um, and it's not a particularly uh, attractive uh, list uh, a poor CV, you might say. Um, just to, it's slightly unfair to do this, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway, which is to list um, uh, Eritrea's foreign policy problems. Troubled relations with Sudan since the late 1980s, the National Islamic Front in Khartoum, uh, a, a series of accusations and counter accusations from Asmara and Khartoum that the others supporting the others' uh, enemies. And also, of course, the uh, crucial question of Eritrean refugees on Sudanese soil. A brief war with Yemen in 1996 over a group of islands, uh, the Hanish Islands. Uh, a war which was resolved, it has to be said, through uh, international intervention. Ongoing problems with Djibouti, uh, despite um, uh, agreements in 2004-2006, there remains a standoff uh, at, uh, along the border between Eritrea and Djibouti, and repeated clashes that go back, in fact, to the mid to late 1990s. Djibouti has always been seen, from Asmara's point of view, as something of an Ethiopian stooge, and certainly not one to be uh, trusted. And then, of course, there was Ethiopia itself, the big one. And the war needs no detail here, except to note that, uh, as time goes on, the 91 to 98 period looks more and more like a brief armistice in a very long war indeed. <clears throat> 
It meant that by 1998, uh, Eritrea had clashed with every one of its land and maritime neighbours. And even those who have been sympathetic to Eritrea began to wonder, is this never Eritrea's fault? Perhaps there is something uh, in Eritrea's behaviour that's, that's bringing this uh, about. And it brings to mind uh, the story that Dan Cannell tells um, of uh, Petra Solomon, uh, now languishing in jail, but formerly the foreign minister in Eritrea, who joked that they <coughs> called themselves in the foreign ministry the fire brigade. Uh, President Isaias throws a bomb past us and we rush to put the fire out. Now, ultimately, all these strained relationships have led through the 1990s and um, uh, early 2000s to a series of ongoing and delicately interrelated proxy wars in Sudan, uh, notably in the south, also in the northeast, in Darfur. Uh, in Ethiopia, Eritrea is involved uh, with the Oromo uh, struggle in the Ogaden, and of course in um, Somalia. There have been strained relations with the world beyond, beginning with the OAU and more recently the AU, toward which Eritrea was often ill-tempered and intolerant, perhaps with good reason, but it meant that when war broke out in 1998, Eritrea found itself with no friends to fall, uh, fall back on. Uh, difficult relations with the US, again I'll come to that in a moment, and the EU. In the non-state sphere, um, trouble with NGOs, UN agencies, human rights organizations, the list is a depressingly uh, long one. Each of these non-state actors uh, the Eritrean government saw as troublesome and meddling and uh, they're only there to kind of somehow undermine its hard-won sovereignty. Um, I should point out that the book, you'll have gathered by now perhaps, doesn't have very much to say about Eritrea's friends. Um, Eritrea does have friends. Um, they're not necessarily particularly forthcoming. Um, but a lot of these friendships are superficial and transient. And um, China and Libya uh, at times have been close allies, certain Gulf states such as Qatar. Um, this was pointed out at the London launch uh, last week. Um, someone said, where's Eritrea's friends? So I feel obliged to put in a disclaimer that if we do a second volume, it'll all be about Eritrea's friendships. Um, but I think that Eritrea's enemies, uh, those with whom it's been, uh, had hostile relations, have been more important in shaping the young country's history so far than any superficial friendships. I don't want to go into any detail uh, on the various themes that the book deals with, but I, I just want to deal with uh, two or three uh, core ideas, um, if I may. The first is the evolution of the EPLF's political culture and the route by which it comes to power. Um, second is the central position, uh, both practically and emotionally, occupied by Ethiopia in the region and in the wider diplomatic community. And thirdly, specifically, the US-Eritrea uh, relationship. Uh, the EPLF's political culture is characterized by a deep-seated militarism, uh, muscularity in both its internal and its external uh, dealings. It's suspicious of outsiders, however these are defined, and it is very broadly defined. Um, and this has not come about. The EPLF that we see in Parnasmara today is not some weird aberration from the normal run of events. It's the result of a very long frontier war uh, that Eritrea has been fighting. In many ways, it dates to the 1950s. And often when I say that to policy folk, they, you can see their eyes glazing over. We have to kind of go back to the 1950s to find the roots of this. But in fact, the EPLF has been fighting uh, this war for a very long time, or the Eritrean movement has been fighting this war a long time. Um, the EPLF's militarized uh, uh, structure um, is the result of persistent misunderstanding and misrepresentation uh, in the wider global community of long-standing cycles of violence uh, in the region. The armed struggle was not the place to learn the finer points of diplomatic interaction. And it has proved since the early 1990s that the EPLF don't really know how to do diplomatic interaction particularly well. Um, all of this added up to a pretty grisly inheritance that... Um, the EPLF has struggled to overcome, um, and in many ways, uh, the current leadership seems to lack the imagination and flexibility to overcome that legacy. Um, so this isolationist and very angry political culture uh, is rooted in the betrayals of the past. Um, the EPLF has also had to contend with um, the 
special status long enjoyed by Ethiopia in the region and the wider uh, world at large. Um, despite Eritrea's best efforts, Ethiopia remains the region's powerhouse. It remains the diplomatic hub. It is the focus of international attention. Um, I'll come back to this in a second in terms of the U.S. position. And Eritrea's challenge to that uh, was never likely to be easy, um, nor was it going to win it many, many friends. I should add at this point um, that this book is not about condemning the Eritrean government uh, or castigating it, but, uh, although that's precisely, of course, how it will be seen, and as Mara, I have no doubt. It's aimed at understanding how this um, has come about. Eritrea's history in global perspective needs to be understood. Uh, and in fact, you could say that Eritrea's position today is the result of failings on the part of the UN between the 1960s and the 1980s, when it neglected um, the, the Eritrean uh, question. Um, Eritrea's regional wars need to be understood uh, not simply as the warmongering of one crazy individual, but as entirely rational. Uh, Somalia, Djibouti, Ethiopia, these are, uh, these are Eritrea's security hinterland, and, and it believes it has the right to um, uh, take up opportunities in those areas, let's say. Um, just very quickly on the uh, Eritrea-US um, uh, relationship, um, and we do say uh, uh, quite a bit about this in, in the book, um, Eritrea and uh, US relations have always been difficult during the Cold War, uh, and more recently in the, the, the war on terror, uh, the U.S.'s key ally, of course, has been Ethiopia. Eritrea has been secondary to that, or it has even been an obstacle uh, at various points. Every Eritrean knows this. Uh, Eritreans are brought up believing that the U.S., uh, although it may be a nice place to live, is in fact an enemy. Um, and although this is ancient history, no doubt, to uh, Americans, to Eritreans it's very fresh, and it is very relevant. The, the U.S. betrayed Ethiopia, uh, uh, Eritrea, at particular uh, crucial moments in its history. The new administration here in, in, in Washington needs to address this, I would suggest, for a new start to be made. In the 1990s, there was a promising start uh, made. Eritrea and the U.S., in fact, had much in common. Eritrea also had its war against uh, Islamism. Uh, it had trouble with Sudan, which uh, also uh, uh, the Clinton administration did. And Isaiah Safwerki himself was part of the African Renaissance, which you now mention and people kind of smirk. Um, but there was a Renaissance, briefly, um, and Isaiah was part of it. But Eritrean aggression and apparent, uh, its prickly response to various problems uh, worried uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, even then, and the relationship has deteriorated rapidly. Uh, even when Eritrea was receiving humanitarian aid, of course, uh, Asmara was claiming that the CIA was plotting to overthrow the Eritrean government. Post 9 11, the relationship, relationship has gone from bad to worse. Um, Eritrean dabblings in Somalia, Ethiopia's own disastrous uh, invasion of Somalia, um, Eritrean uh, restrictions placed on the US embassy in Asmara. Uh, in, in 2007, then, the, the threat that Eritrea would be labelled a state sponsor of terror, which was the response in Asmara was absolute outrage that this could come about. So the, there is uh, has been recently uh, rife anti-Americanism uh, in Eritrea. And many Eritreans accept this uh, because it seems to be consistent with the way that the U.S. has behaved over the last 40, 50 uh, years. So the U.S. Uh, needs to weigh up its options, I think, and strategies very, very carefully um, and to engage with Eritrea uh, as much as possible and not um, isolated. It also needs to pressure Ethiopia uh, over the boundary, uh, uh, boundary issue. Um, there's no question that Eritrea is potentially, and I have no doubt that in the future it will be, a crucial ally in the region, and it will be uh, 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 a point of stability uh, in the region. Some final summing up points, uh, just to bring this um, together. Um, there is a strikingly symbiotic relationship between aggressive external affairs and internal authoritarianism. Um, the Eritrean government says that the neighborhood it lives in, the threats to its security, require constant vigilance and a high degree of militari uh, militarization. Yet the armed adventures that the Eritreans have recently uh, engaged in also require that level of militarization and author uh, authoritarianism. We need to consider that relationship a little more carefully. 
Eritrean foreign policy and Eritrea's domestic politics are indelibly interlinked. We have seen, for obvious reasons, uh, a recent panic about what goes on in Yemen. Suffice to see here that it will serve no one to see a kind of failed state scenario across the sea in Eritrea either. There needs to be engagement with Eritrea, an engagement based on a, on a far greater degree of understanding of Eritrea's past and current grievances than has previously uh, been the case. Isolation plays into Isaias' hands, and he's fond of saying, the dogs bark, but the camel continues to march. The UN sanctions for Isaias will be the dogs barking, but he will continue to march. No one is quite sure where the camel is marching to, but it marches nonetheless. Um, pushing Eritrea into a corner will serve nothing, uh, no, no purpose. And already, of course, we hear uh, uh, reports that Eritrea is already uh, cozying up to Iran and, and so on. Isolation will cause things to get better, uh, worse rather than, they, 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 uh, rather than getting better. Isolation will ultimately uh, fuel Isaias' determination to wage war by other means. He'll be able to argue, I was right all along, the US doesn't understand, the world doesn't understand, I'm the only one who understands. Engagement will remove one of Isaias' key raison d'etre, which is that isolation suits him, and he, it suits a particular uh, style of government. The international community missed a trick in the 2000-2002 period um, not to place much greater pressure on Ethiopia to fully implement the Boundary Commission's findings and thereby the Algiers Agreement that supposedly ended the war. Sometimes uh, Ethiopian Prime Minister Mele Zenawi seems to have a very thin skin. But generally, the Ethiopian skin is thicker than the Eritreans. The, Eritreans could have ta uh, the Ethiopians could have taken a little more uh, abuse at that time. Eritrea needed much more uh, tender loving care in the wake of the war. It was much more hurt uh, and shaken by it. As it is, crucially, the perception in Asmara that the world is lined up behind Ethiopia, no matter what Ethiopia does, is one of the most dangerous and damaging sources of instability in the region today, and in many ways has led to uh, the current situation. Until that's addressed, Eritrea's external relations will remain extremely difficult. One final point to make is that we cannot deal with Eritrea in isolation. Uh, Eritrea is the product of its environment, just as Isaiah Safwerki is the product of the political uh, environment uh, in Eritrea itself. Eritrea's external relations are intimately linked to the internal uh, situation. Everything is interconnected in the, Horn of the, uh, in the Horn of Africa. We need a much more holistic integrated approach on the part of the international community. Making Eritrea the region's bad boy, the whipping boy, uh, when in fact we know that uh, there are a number um, of, of uh, movements that uh, support, uh, at least tacitly, Eritrea's defiant position against uh, Ethiopia. Um, the, uh, the punishment uh, imposed on Eritrea is deeply unhelpful, it's unimaginative, and uh, will not solve anything in uh, the near future. Again, engagement is absolutely fundamental in order for uh, 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 the, the region to be stabilized. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much for opening. Uh, Dr. Selassie, can you respond for us? Uh, I would like, first of all, to congratulate Richard uh, and his colleagues, the participants in the volume. I haven't read the volume. I glanced through uh, your chapter. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's going to be a very useful book for policymakers, certainly very interesting for uh, academics. I share your final thoughts of the importance of engagement. However, engagement uh, implies two parties. As the saying goes, it takes two to tango. Has there been enough uh, pressure brought to bear on Ethiopia uh, to implement the decision of the tribunal? No. There, too, I agree with you. And therefore, 
Eritrea's prickliness uh, can be explained partly, anyway, uh, by the failure of the international community uh, to uh, implement the commendable work of the International Tribunal. I also think that your historical perspective is very useful. Uh, I am a kind of histo uh, history buff myself. Thirty years ago, I spent uh, some time in this place, the Wilson Center, during the regime of uh, Billington. Uh, and I learned a great deal of history uh, at that time. The point you raise about the uh, the point of uh, Eritrea being in the periphery uh, and uh, perceived as a place inhabited by unruly people, warlike people, uh, is not a new, th a new one. Uh, throughout Ethiopian history, Ethiopian Eritrean history, that has been the perception and that has been part of the problem. There's a saying in Amharic which is very uh, revealing Daragar Keheda Mahal Darihonal, which roughly translated means if the periphery goes, the center becomes periphery, periphery, uh, which is an imperial concept. Uh, and that, that uh, uh, insight, I think, has uh, defined much of Ethio Eritrean relationship historically. Uh, that part of your, of your paper, I think, is extremely useful, uh, very insightful and very useful. Uh, however, uh, I, I part company with you uh, in uh, that we cannot blame history. I think that the uh, examination of current reality, of the behavior of the current leaders of both Ethiopia and Eritrea, and I w we are dealing with Eritrea, of course, uh, is... Uh, uh, probably the most important, the more uh, salient factor to explain the crisis of the region. Although uh, his history is uh, helpful in explaining some parts of it, I think that the, by far the most important factor to explain the problem is uh, current history, uh, especially the behavior, uh, you mentioned it, uh, the, the uh, resort to militarism, the resort uh, to uh, military solutions to all problems, or to most problems, has been one of the problems of Eritrea. And uh, again, as you explained it, it, it is uh, a function of the history of the armed struggle, which Eritrea was forced to undertake with the failure of international diplomacy. The sense of betrayal that the Eritreans felt when uh, Emperor Haile Selassie annexed Eritrea in violation of uh, international principles, in violation of the uh, federal uh, scheme uh, mandated by the United Nations. And uh, Eritrea's, Eritrean's uh, plea for help fell on deaf ears. Uh, and so Eritreans were forced to take up arms, not because they loved to show off arms, but because there was no other alternative. And the 30 years of history of, of struggle, I think, has defined the Eritrean attitude towards others, towards uh, neighbors, and towards the international community. That part of your, of your uh, thesis is also, I think, uh, quite, uh, quite important, quite right. Um, my belief is that a nation that is at war with itself, as Eritrea is, has been for quite a while, will be at war with its neighbors. Therefore, the, the point about the, authoritarian, the internal authoritarianism linked to, to the foreign policy of Eritrea is something which should be pursued much more vigorously, uh, not only by scholars, but by, by policymakers. Uh, the reason why Eritrean leaders have resorted to arms in, in, instead of or uh, emphasizing arms, uh, uh, preferring arms rather to diplomacy, can be explained in, in historical terms. Uh, 
but the doggedness with which the current Eritrean leadership um, opted for armed uh, confrontation in 1998 uh, is something which can be explained only by a look, by an examination of the leadership itself, and particularly the, the, the principal leader, Isaiah Saforke, uh, who was always, I think, had been pugnacious. Uh, so an examination of the personality and the history and the character of the leadership, I think, is a critical element in explaining the current crisis. That part of it, I think, I have not read the book, but uh, if, it's, if, if it's absent, <laughs> then I, I make a plea that it sh should be uh, uh, taken up. In your conclusion, uh, you quite rightly uh, uh, pleaded for engagement. Isolation will not help anybody. It certainly will not help Eritrea. But uh, if we examine why Eritrea has come to this predicament, uh, we cannot put the blame only on, uh, on the international community. There has been a long-standing, persistent plea by the international community, by the United States government, by its diplomats, and others, by the European Union, uh, asking the Eritrean leader uh, to, uh, to behave more responsibly. Somalia's uh, proxy war, uh, according to some analysis, is a necessity, a war of necessity for Eritrea, uh, because as a small nation, a fragile nation, it doesn't have enough resources to engage Ethiopia or Sudan or other potential uh, adversaries, uh, so it has to resort to other means. The, the war by other means that is engaged uh, in, in Somalia, I think, is destructive. Uh, I think that in the engagement that you propose, that has to be re-examined. What has pushed Eritrea to be engaged in, in Somalia? To, to, be, to be involved in, in Somalia. Uh, the, the, the straight answer to that is that uh, the failure of the international community to, to, to force Ethiopia to accept the, the solution, uh, the recommendations of the, the decision of, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, tribunal. We can quibble about that. We can argue whether uh, there might have been other methods. Well, given the nature of the situation and also given the character of the, of the leadership uh, sh should have been anticipated. It should have been anticipated, and uh, anticipatory uh, diplomacy could have avoided the crisis. That's one of my, of my, of my, uh, of my points. There's a failure, therefore, to go around, failure among the international community, particularly the, America, the Americans and the Europea European Union, uh, blame to go around uh, e everywhere. An analysis of Isaiah Safork's character and history is going to be very useful, very important, not only for academics, but for policymakers. His preference, uh, his first choice of, of uh, confrontation has a history. It cannot be explained only in terms of the long arm struggle. I am I'm, I'm making a plea that it has to be examined more uh, uh, pointedly. There should be a laser point uh, uh, analysis of why this leader, this particular leader, is behaving the way he has been behaving. Uh, I agree with you that there are blames to go around, but I also think that uh, his, his, his own uh, policy uh, and the structure that, has, that has, he has put in place, which uh, Dan Connell, in one of his writings, I don't know whether he's included in, the, in this volume, has explained uh, rather, rather well in terms of what he calls the uh, nesting of uh, creation of uh, layered organizations with a core which he can manipulate in advance in pursuit of, of Eritrean national interests. Reasonable on the face of it, but in terms of the result, it's disastrous. It's disastrous. A British uh, journalist friend of mine once told me around 1996, she uh, interviewed uh, Hassan Turabi, uh, at the time when Eritrea and Ethiopia, Eritrea and Sudan were not on good terms, but 
uh, not going to come to war, not going to war. She asked him what he thought of Isaiah Saforke. He said, Isaiah Saforke is a very intelligent man, but he has the mentality of a regimental sergeant major who thinks he can rule the world. There is an element of truth in that. I rest my case. Well, that should certainly uh, prick some interest here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Um, uh, Selassie. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. I think you've uh, outlined uh, a good way forward for us, and, and, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in the questions and answers. Uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me first of all uh, apologize for not doing my homework. I didn't realize you were a fellow here before. So, uh, I was so a fellow here before. I was, I'm also uh, a fellow. Uh, uh, SOS is my alma mater. Also. Oh, so three of us are. Uh, no. <laughs> Speaks well for us, the SOAS, I hope. Um, but, uh, but apologies and welcome home. <laughs> uh, also, uh, also uh, to uh, to uh, uh, correct one thing that uh, an omission, and and that is the Chatham House has worked very diligently with us to bring this uh, event together today, and so I do consider them a co-sponsor and thank Chatham House and uh, uh, for all of their efforts on our behalf. Um, before we throw the floor open to questions, and you can direct your questions at either or or anybody up here, uh, I want to uh, let you know that this is being webcast. Uh, we always do that now with our events. Uh, that will be available later in the archives, but it's going out live now. So when you uh, are recognized to ask a question, uh, please wait for the microphone to get to you and identify yourself and, and the uh, organizations you're associated with for the sake of the webcast. Um, we will uh, uh, proceed uh, as we normally do and probably take two or three questions at a time uh, to try to bundle them up for the uh, for our panel to uh, to address. Uh, please make your questions short. Try to avoid long comments or uh, or oratory. Um, and uh, so I throw the floor open to you. I see one right away. John. John. <laughs> uh, John Harbison Sice. Um, when you say engagement. It's like the first half of an incomplete sentence, as far as I'm concerned. Engagement with what and with whom? It seems to me that what needs to, it was a Sicilian problem, and I think our own government has is, is been a part of this, is the failure to look at the horn holistically. Why has Melis been unwilling to, to agree to the border thing? What about the other issues? What about the economic connections between those two countries, which is not the cause, but it certainly is, is an irritant? What about the fact that their two constitutional systems are diametrically opposed, even in principle, and each regards the other as, as a destructive of the fabric of the horn as a whole? What about the fact that, the, the, the two, that it's really now a bipolar horn, not a monopolar horn? So I think the deeper issues that have have I don't hear them. I haven't seen your book. I I, I, don't, I had, didn't hear those. What about the deeper issues, and what about engaging with those issues? As far as I'm concerned, that hasn't happened. But uh, that's a pretty broad question. So we'll take one more and then try to answer that. I see a hand over here, Terry. Good morning, uh, Terence Lyons from George Mason University, and thank you for the interesting uh, session. I also look forward to uh, to reading the book. The the, the 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 staying on the question of the sort of the history of engagement and and how from that history we may understand uh, new opportunities for engagement. I want to recall that when I first started looking at the Horn of Africa in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the EPLF had the best engagement, the best diplomacy imaginable, here in Washington at least. Much, much better than the embassy of the Mengistu Halamariam's embassy at that time, much, much better than the TPLF's representation uh, in town. They were, uh, they were smart, they had great public diplomacy, they had outreach to NGOs, think tanks, academics. Uh, and, and from that late 1980s, early 1990s stories, we had really a period of time in the, in the early 1990s, from 91 through 93, through the, the uh, new generation of leaders and the frontline states, really a, a, a period of successful engagement, or at least positive engagement between the United States and Eritrea. And so my, the puzzle really that I have is how did that uh, record of successful uh, liberation diplomacy, if you will, uh, get lost? And how did that record or that, that, the, these, the, those early years of positive interaction between Washington and the Eritrean uh, people, the EPLF, uh, get lost? <laughs> 
Okay, thank you very much, Terry. I do think those are very fulsome questions, so, so let's stop there for the moment and have at, shall we answer in the order of speaking. So, uh, Richard and then... Uh, yeah, um, with, with regard to the, the first question, um, I absolutely uh, agree. I mean, I think, um, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, I, I, a more holistic, integrated approach is absolutely vital. You can't, uh, there, there, and, and you, you mentioned a couple of areas that are of great interest, which is um, the, the fact that in Eritrea and Ethiopia you have two very different political systems, two very different political cultures in a sense. I mean, um, the TPLF has had to kind of compromise to some degree within Addis Ababa since the early 90s in ways that the EPLF didn't. Um, and the economic sphere. Um, and I, w I, w I would add another one to that, which is uh, environmental shifts on the sort of economic peripheries of, of the Horn also need to be taken into account. Um, it often seems absolutely that there's no joined up thinking. And uh, frequently it's a zero sum game. Someone wins, the other guy loses. Um, engage with what or whom? I mean, I, I, I think. Um, my, my initial instinct is that there must be some engagement with, however troublesome it may seem, with the current uh, regime. Um, but to do that um, in such a way that makes it clear that the US is not condoning um, authoritarianism in Eritrea, uh, but to use uh, pressure to democratize and talk about civil liberties and the, the shutdown press and so on, while on the other hand, um, dealing with these other questions, first and foremost, Ethiopia's failure to uh, abide by uh, the, the, the Boundary Commission's ruling, um, so that Asmara can't say, why are you giving us all the grief, and yet you don't, you don't pressure Ethiopia to do this, this, and this. So that would be a beginning of a, a, at least a two-pronged approach, uh, to pressure Eritrea and to begin talking to Eritrea about um, some degree of... of, of uh, civil liberties, um, perhaps not full-blown democracy, but also pressuring um, Ethiopia to um, behave itself on, on the northern border. Um, I also think the U.S. has a, a, a vital role to play, potentially as a broker, um, between the regime in Asmara and various uh, elements of the diaspora. And those various, I, I don't mean necessarily you know, sponsoring one particular opposition party over another, um, but to... Uh, map out where these various humanitarian NGO groups uh, among the diaspora are actually uh, based, what are they up to, uh, what's the groundswell of opinion. Um, um, it's, it's a very delicate business, but to do so in such a way as to make it clear that the U.S. is not sponsoring a, a government in exile, but to kind of bring to bear some gentle pressure um, on, on, on Asmara. But crucially, to do so at the same time that you're indicating that uh, the Ethiopia must abide by the Boundary Commission ruling. Even if you do that, nothing might change, but you, you begin to remove the props. You're stripping away um, uh, uh, Isaias's excuses. And, and, and as long as the Boundary uh, remains live, um, he will use that as, uh, as an excuse. So I, I, I absolutely agree that there needs to be more um, joined up thinking. Um, the other huge question from uh, Terry about uh, what's gone wrong I think you, uh, a comparison could be made with uh, the domestic situation, that um, in the early 90s there was much kind of hope and optimism and everyone said this is wonderful, um, the EPLF is progressive and pragmatic and so on, and suddenly um, it turns out that that wasn't, that wasn't the case. Um, I can only respond by, it's a huge question, but I, I, I think that the answer lies in the deeper history of the movement itself. Um, and to use the domestic um, situation as, a, as, a, as an example, um, in 2001, when the G15 or the G11 uh, were, were, were locked up, everyone suddenly remembered uh, the Manka crisis, and, and suddenly there were various kind of um, recollections and memoirs of, uh, ah, well, this is what they did in 73, they locked up the progressive movements and so on. There, are often, there often seems to be a kind of pact of forgetting. Um, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not unusual in, in countries that have gone through such trauma. Algeria and Spain are two examples that spring to mind, where the pact of forgetting is we will not talk about that, but, you know. But it's, it's, it's just kept in the cupboard and it's drawn out again whenever things go wrong. And I think in the mid-90s, you're right that there was a great deal of potential for the U.S. and Eritrea to really make some strides. 
But I think Eritrea felt, Isaias particularly felt, that the U.S. owed it, and it owed it big time and wanted some kind of recompense. I mean, I think when he came here, was it in February 95, something like that, and, he, and, and uh, military assistance against uh, Islamism uh, and Sudan was very much on, on his agenda. And considering what they had gone through and, and, and the experience of the struggle, they remained, however well-oiled their machinery may have been, they were very quick to take offence and to detect that they weren't being taken seriously enough. And there was, a, a, I suspect, a deeper sense that while all that may be true, there was not really an understanding of what the EPLF had gone through and what in the young independent Eritrea's problems in the region were, including particularly um, Ethiopia. Um, so I, it's, it's, I, I'm tempted to say that they had a sense of entitlement once they had won uh, independence and, and any kind of sense that that entitlement was not actually uh, uh, being met in the international community was going to kind of result in some degree of the Eritreans throwing the toys out of the pram and saying, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not engaging anymore then because you're not, you're not treating me with the full respect that we think we deserve. Yeah, just a word uh, to add to that, uh, to in response to Terry Lyon's question. Terry, I didn't see you when I came in, sorry. Good to see you again. Um, it will be self-serving if I uh, dwell on the diplomacy, uh, the pre-independent diplomacy, because I was part of it. You were part of that, yes. I was part of it. But um, one reason why I think uh, we were more successful uh, than perhaps the, the, the current dip diplomats was that uh, distance. Distance. We had a leeway, an autonomy of a sort, uh, and uh, there was no internet at the time. Uh, we had uh, telexes, they often broke down. So pre we pretty much did what, what, what uh, we thought what was right. And uh, by and large, uh, we were um, supported. So, in, that, in, in, the, in the sense that they, the leadership in the field, uh, supports whatever we did, uh, it shows that they were responsive to uh, some uh, good diplomacy. Why it changed? Well, uh, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier on. It, it all boils down to uh, leadership. Uh, you have to analyze the structure of the Foreign Office in Eritrea. Is there a structure? Is there uh, a, a Minister of Foreign Affairs who can independently work out a, a strategy? Uh, is there a foreign minister, actually, who is independent? There is none. <coughs> the policy of the government coming out from the president's office is broadcast by the current minister of, of, of information. He is, in effect, in effect, the minister of foreign affairs, sitting minister of foreign affairs. Uh, and therefore, uh, the failure of diplomacy is the failure of leadership or is it in the nature of the leadership, put it that way? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Hello, Adi Borhani with Samuel Media. Thank you all very much for this uh, presentation and for making the trip across the pond. You said that Eritrean children or Eritreans are raised to perhaps hate America or know America as an enemy. I don't recall being raised that way, but I was raised uh, knowing what John Foster Dulles said, and that was the beginning of how America began with Eritrea. And I do know of the uh, $20 million worth of arms that the Carter administration did sell to a uh, Marxist regime. So I guess in some ways, perhaps we were raised in a way to know and to be politicized in that way. But I don't recall any such animosity when we were, did receive our liberation uh, through armed struggle. There is a reason why America and, and Eritrea broke down, and some of it has to do with Sid Barre and what the U.S. wanted out of uh, President Issa Safa working. Uh, my former professor, Dr. Berdachet, you know, is calling for some sort of psycho Freudian analysis of President Isias. I don't agree with that. But I have a, one issue, and I haven't read your book, but with what you've continuously said today, which is that the U.S. needs to uh, pressure Ethiopia to uh, accept the ruling of the Boundary Commission. There's so much evidence that the U.S. 
has not only not pressured Ethiopia, but according to Ambassador Bolton, not known as a friend of Eritrea, and the leaked UN memo from Gender and I Frazier, that the U.S. has actually been hindering the implementation of the findings of the Boundary Commission. There's a difference, in my opinion, between not pressuring and actually being an obstacle. So it's sort of like um, you're not really paranoid if they're really following you. So if you could, you know, perhaps address that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good question. That one right across the way there. Yeah. Hi, um, Samhar Raya with Oxfam. Uh, thank you, Richard and Dr. Bedelhut, for your presentations. I had a question similar to the last two about this engagement aspect, and particularly both of you highlighted the personality issues within the Eritrea and Ethiopia context and the historical um, reverberations of continued failed policies. And I'd like to maybe ask on the other side of this is the Washington and United States perspectives and Eritreans hold a deep um, you know, index of all the times that Washington and the international community has misunderstood Eritrea. But I think in this particular juncture when we have um, a new administration and I think many of us had high hopes for 2009, the first year with President Obama, um, a return of, of many um, personalities and individuals who had worked on the horn for for, year, for decades, uh, 20, 30 years, who are familiar with EPLF, who knew, who had previously engaged. We have some people here in the room who have, who served in that capacity in the Clinton administration. And I think we, ex many of us everywhere, expected to see a, a resumption of engagement in this holistic way. And instead, it's more of the same. Um, if, if, if either one of you could comment sort of on the prospects of engagement within this administration, because we we're seeing a continued uh, perspective on uh, counterterrorism, emphasis on military um, responses to the horn, when clearly there's a need for humanitarian response, economic engagement, political re resolution. And this was the administration many of us felt were, were most likely to pursue that. Um, and, and I'm sorry, Richard, for making you answer in the contemporary sense, but, but realistically, many of us are sitting here in Washington and thinking, what now um, with Somalia? with the sanctions, with these Ethiopian elections, with Eritrea's continued isolation and now more or less being punished um, by the international community. So, Thank you very much. A very good question. Do I have one more? We'll take right at the back there. Hi, my name is Asmedit, and I go to American University. And I have a question in regards to Eritrea's economic development. Um, uh, as we know, and as you probably know, this is for Dr. Selassie, that 60% of Eritrea is covered in green st uh, greenstone belts, and there's a lot of um, exploration going on for gold and copper, particularly from foreign investors from Australia and Canada. And um, we've read literature about the resource court curse in certain countries in Africa and things like that. And since there's drilling that's going to happen this year, um, what do you think this ha means for the um, stabilization of Eritrea, especially since the Ministry of er um, Energy just reported that they want Eritrea to be a um, mining country? So what do you think this means for prospects for the future? Okay, thank you very much. We'll feel those and maybe start with you, Dr. Slossi, and uh, pick up on the resource curse, curse question first. And okay. uh, in one of his uh, l latest interviews, uh, President Isaias uh, responded to a question by I forget who the journalist was, uh, who asked him, "Will things change economically? Will there be some uh, uh, development, better development, because uh, of the mining, because of gold?" And the answer of the president was, um, "No." Uh, he didn't explain it, but he said, he, he, my, my reading of his response was that uh, we should not depend on gold or any, or, or any minerals. We should depend on other resources. That has been his, his policy from the beginning, even uh, when in the field. Uh, and uh, I think this makes sense. Uh, that's one of those rare uh, points on which I agree with uh, President Isaias, uh, because the dependence on one particular uh, uh, commodity like oil or gold, has brought uh, a lot of distress, disaster to Africans. So I personally do not put too much uh, uh, value on, 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 on that. Um, and uh, any comments on that, uh, the economic question, or we want I'll, to I'll, I'll stay out of the economics. Uh, okay, stay out of the economics. Okay, then we've got the questions, of course, on uh, the 
the hopes of the Obama administration, any sort of uh, uh, new ground to expect mm -hmm. there, and, and then the U.S. Uh, in terms of its uh, hindering compliance on the Boundaries Commission. And yeah, I think, I mean, this, this is um, very distressing. To, to I, I, Recently, I've heard um, similar mutterings uh, in the U.K. Foreign Office that um, there have been correspondence passing across desks to the effect that um, it really wouldn't have mattered what Eritrea would have done. Eritrea was going to be punished for this and, and, that, and that Ethiopia is, no matter what, I, I, it's a series of um, very uh, f um, friendly UK ambassadors in Addis Ababa in recent years um, and we've got Tony Blair to thank for that. These, these, these were men who Tony Blair liked <laughs> and, and he liked also Mela Zanawi. And the, these, these personal relationships uh, are, are actually very important um, and, and they, they matter uh, very deeply when it comes to areas where there's this, otherwise there's actually quite a lot of darkness, nobody's quite sure who to deal with. So you, you, if you hone in on people who you can do business with and, and Meles is certainly one of those. Um, and even though there have been some voices in the UK Foreign Office saying this is a disastrous idea, sanctions should not go ahead. Um, the push was coming from above somewhere um, that um, Ethiopia uh, needs to be right in this and um, Ethiopia needs to be the stable center and Eritrea is now becoming, to be blunt, a pain in the ass and it will be punished. The same, the same goes for the, the Boundary Commission. I, I, I had heard some similar uh, stories that, that, that the US is actually an obstacle to the Boundary Commission. Um, what to say? I mean, it, it was quite clear that um, it, after 9-11, although also, I mean, Eritrea also offered itself up rather too readily, I, I thought at the time, but uh, in, in um, the, the coalition of the willing, uh, that's going back a few years, um, <laughs> Eritrea and Ethiopia, I think, were among the two first countries to sign up for it, which was um, rather kind of ironic, um, but not coincidental. Um, both wanted to be seen to be on the front line against terrorism. Uh, the U.S. preferred Ethiopia. Uh, it, it, it preferred Ethiopia for all sorts of reasons. Um, Eritrea was seen as a kind of bunker state. Uh, they were less easy to control. Ethiopia had a more reliable military, perhaps. Their policy were, was, was, was able to kind of direct toward, uh, their, their policy was, was more directable and perhaps predictable. Uh, whereas, and going back to kind of Terry's point, I mean, in, in, in the, from the mid-90s onwards, it was clear that Eritrea was slightly unpredictable and, and couldn't quite be relied upon to do certain things that Washington might want it to do. Um, so given this, um, it's extremely worrying, but not entirely surprising that um, not only did the US not pressure Ethiopia, but actually decided that it was better to keep Eritrea kind of at, at arm's length and not in fact bring it in um, uh, th through you know, the, the stabilizing of the northern border. Um, I think, however, this is uh, now proving to be entirely counterproductive, which is what um, we try to argue uh, in the book. And this sort of links with Samar's question about um, the prospects of a new uh, relationship. It must look um, pretty bleak at the moment. Um, I've given a number of these talks recently, and um, I always leave the room slightly le uh, more depressed um, than I, I was when I came into it. Um, I actually do remain, um, I'm going to try to be optimistic to some extent. Um, I'm trying very hard. Um, I think Eritrea has, um, it, 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 it responds very, very quickly militarily, we know that. But it also, in the past it has proved very pragmatic and, it, and, and, and the government does think, has thought on its feet quite quickly and Eritrea can change quite, quite quickly. The EPLF can decide um, that, all right, we will talk to the Americans or we, we will establish a dialogue and, and something will happen. I, I, n none of these things are absolutely inexorable. Um, and I think that's the first thing to remember, that, that any kind of respectful engagement, I, I, I remain, perhaps better get, would disagree, I, I, I'm convinced that there are certain elements within the Eritrean government that will respond to that and will respond um, fairly quickly. And I think that this thing might be turned around um, fairly swiftly. I mean, for, as far as the U.S. is concerned, it is disappointing to be at the beginning of 2010 and find uh, Eritrea more isolated than when Obama came in. That's absolutely uh, correct. 
Um, to do nothing, however, will be disastrous. To, to let the situation fester um, is simply not an option. Um, because you will, er, er, Eritrea, that, that northern region has a great potential for chaos. And that's why I, I strongly recommend engagement along a, a multi pronged engagement that is not simply reliant on Isaias uh, and the Isaias clique, but also with democratic forces outside Eritrea, if, if that trick can be managed. I mean, the three basic options facing the US are the current one complete isolation and containment, uh, limited engagement regime change. Um, regime change is not an option. Um, so you have to sort of balance one and two. That there has to be some degree of uh, limited engagement, but not unconditional. Clearly, uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, my, my answer to the question earlier, uh, is that the, you know, con engagement that also um, brings with it evidence of an integrated holistic approach that, un that understands Eritrea's security concerns in a wider region. Um, and uh, brings to bear some kind of um, uh, uh, pressure on, on the internal situation. Would you like to bear those? I, yes, I, I just again, a, a point to add to what Richard said. Uh, engagement, yes, but what kind of engagement? True. Uh, the sanctions have been imposed historically. W once sanctions are imposed, it takes a long time for them to be taken off the table. That's going to be a very, very serious problem for Eritrea. Uh, but uh, I, I think the Americans can, can say justly that uh, we give Eritrea enough warning, enough time, even w in announcing the, uh, the uh, sanctions uh, before it, it passed. Sudan Rice actually said this is just uh, a chance for Eritrea uh, to engage. In other words, I don't think they've, they closed the door. Uh, so, and, and by the way, Susan Rice, whom I happen to know, uh, when, whom I met when Isaias came here just before the war, well, admired Isaias immensely. Uh, and and uh, the way he treated her when she went there as emissary for President Clinton probably changed her mind, but she, she, she thought he was a great, a great uh, leader, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Isaias has a tendency, and I, the, I'm speaking from experience, has a tendency to cross people who, who like him. One American journalist, one American journalist, uh, 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 correspondent of the Washington Post, asked me, Barakat, why do I think that this man wants me to hate him? That's a very revealing statement. In fact, I remember going back to my hotel and putting it down, as I always do. That's a very revealing statement. I don't know what the reason is, but he seems to cross people who like him. Uh, let me uh, take the prerogative of the chair because I think there's uh, some uh, an important question here, and, and I'm particularly struck by the uh, uh, by the issue of if the U.S. has been actively hindering uh, compliance with the boundary issue, uh, the boundary uh, uh, compliance. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, of course, we all know, all of us who follow African affairs in terms of the Obama administration, uh, I, I think there is a, a general uh, uh, welcoming of, of, the, uh, of the attention that's been paid with an early presidential and early secretarial visit and, and, and a number of things. But by, by the same token, uh, and, and, you know, the speech in Ghana was great, but by the same token, there has been very little departure in policy terms. Uh, from the previous administration, and that's not about Eritrea alone. Obviously, it's on an lo awful lot of issues, uh, uh, from trade and 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 health and uh, and et cetera. Uh, so, so I take the prerogative of the chair not to ask a question myself uh, and not to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, finger anyone. But I know we do have uh, some uh, f uh, State Department and former State Department uh, individuals in the room. If anyone would like to uh, to take up those two questions, would feel free to do so, Bob. Uh, Barricade. Bob Hodek, retired Foreign Service officer who had been involved with Eritrean Affairs. Barakat said it. It takes two to tango. Mm. And let me just give you a couple of examples at, at attempts at, 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 at engagement. We sent out close to two years ago a very capable American ambassador. He has yet to be allowed to present his credentials. He's never met the president. He's confined to 50 kilometers of Asmara. Um, I can tell you that within at least 
just within the last well six nine months there have been a number of privately initiated by very serious people efforts to do some quiet diplomacy to engage the Eritreans totally rebuffed totally rebuffed by Asmar and when you say by Asmar I don't even want to say the government it's a one-man government. We have to come to that. We have to realize that. Let me come up with one additional thing. Johnny Carson uh, has, has tried, he has applied for a visa. He said, I want to quietly, I want to go out. We've got a lot of, there are issues to discuss. No response. Mm -hmm. I mean, what can you do if you have somebody that is totally unwilling on the other side? Okay. Well, let's not get in arguments, so let's go back to questions. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and my first hand was right over here. And then we'll come back to it. Uh, Don Shirk with BAE Systems. Um, I'd be very interested to know if it's in your opinion that there exists within the Eritrean government any pressure or feeling or willingness to engage in economic integration with its neighboring states. Is there, is there no hope for an economic integration answer to some of the economic problems of Eritrea? Very interesting question. Okay, then my next hand was right over here. My name is Sophia Tesfomeriam, and uh, I'm actually here wanting to see what Dr. Barahat looks like after reading his writings for many years. <laughs> Ta-da. Um, what I also come to these sessions because I'm looking for answers, right? And these one statements about uh, so and so is pugnacious, so and so is this much without any explanation doesn't tell me much because I have my own reservations and I could say you're opportunistic, you're pugnacious, you're rude, you know, you took advantage of Eritreans, you took advantage of Ethiopians, but they wouldn't mean anything unless I give explanations and they could do it in half an hour, right? So we're here to discuss what are the issues in the Horn of Africa today, and this book in particular. The three authors who are in that book are three people who are not engaged with Eritrea, have never been to Eritrea in the last 20 years at least, and have anti-Eritrea sentiments, which Dr. Barahat also shares. So how do we get a, a clear picture of what Eritrea is about from a book that doesn't address the other side? So. That's one issue with the book that I have. The second question of, that I want to ask Dr. Barahat is, when you say no engagement and isolation of Eritrea, you single-handedly promoted a 10-year uh, campaign to isolate Eritrea economically, humanitarian aid. You had many, many, many dealings with the State Department where you wanted them not to have any relationship with Eritrea, so you got your wish. So now the door or the window of opportunity that uh, Jandai Frazier started to close and uh, Susan Rice slammed shut, to me, is a welcome. As, as much as it sounds bad, I, I actually welcome this closing of this window so that Eritreans can breathe a little bit without this uh, nagging and annoyance from, Air, from the United States and, and allies like you if you're what, what represents the United States, and fortunately, you don't represent the United States. So are you going to stop your campaign, or has your campaign now reached its climax? You've got the sanction that you wanted. So what next for you? Okay, thank you very much. We'll take a third question, this gentleman right here. This. <laughs> I think uh, Terry have, has uh, raised a very important question uh, that says, uh, EPLF was the most brilliant organization and what happened and uh, I'd like to give Terry a little hint mm -hmm. the change happened in 1998 when the war started and the answer was given by Prime Minister Meles Zenawi after the war ends and Prime Minister Meles Zenawi said uh, this can be researched said we've done everything we could including buying human beings so that they can help us on a, a war. So all those human beings that were bought by these people start coming out and shading a bad name to Eritrea for the last 10 years. So that's what happened. Eritrea has not changed. The leadership of Eritrea has not changed. Eritrea 
is doing what has been doing, but people change it and become anti-Eritrea. And uh, uh, Richard said uh, President Isaiah's proverb is, the dogs are barking, but the camel is marching. Yes, the camel is marching. Eritrea is the only country that will be succeeded in food security in a very, very near future according to the, uh, to the UN schedule. Eritrea is building 63 schools in 100 days. Eritrea is doing a lot of uh, uh, work for its people. That's what uh, you said, nobody knows where the camel is marching. The camel is marching towards that. So it's not, Eritrea has not changed. It's, it's the money, the lobbying that has thrown into uh, the world by Ethiopia that shaded Eritrea a different picture. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, this is going to have to be our last set of questions. We have to wrap this up in just the next few minutes, so, uh, so I apologize to those of you who didn't get questions in, and let's keep our answers kind of brief. I think, again, the economic integration question, if we start with that, uh, that's probably an easier one to answer than the others. <laughs> yes, I, I don't think that there can be any economic integration uh, until and unless the political problem is resolved. Uh, that is in the nature of things, because uh, decisions to, uh, uh, to bring about economic inter inter intervention depend on leaders. And when leaders are at loggerheads or at each other's throats, as uh, they are in our region, I don't see any chance for economic integration to take place. They had talked about it in, in the early 1990s. There were even committees, joint committees established uh, by the two governments, Ethiopia and Eritrea, uh, joint committees to promote uh, uh, joint development uh, on infrastructure, uh, on security, and, and so on. Uh, but all that f fell by the wayside when the war broke out. Uh, so in my view, I agree that uh, we need economic integration not only of this area, but of the whole of Africa, actually. Uh, but I don't see it coming soon. Uh, I don't think I'm going to answer to the questions uh, posed by uh, Sophia. It is too personal. Uh, she's right in saying that if you make personal statements, you have to back it up. But it would take two, three, four hours for me to back up uh, regarding uh, what, Isaias, uh, what I think about Isaias. Uh, if you think I'm anti-Eritrean, well, you are entitled to your, to, your, to your belief, but I'm not. You know I'm not. I may be anti-Isaias, I'm not anti-Eritrean. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, we had um, the same kind of issue raised in the London launch that um, I, have, I have lined up uh, a set of contributors who um, hate Eritrea or have um, never been to Eritrea and so on. Um, I'm very proud of the team we have lined up. Um, each and every one of them um, is, in fact, if anything, if obviously Eritre many are Eritreans themselves, but love Eritrea, and that's why they're involved in this volume. Unfortunately, um, when you discuss Eritrean issues of this kind, they do tend to split opinion, and inevitably someone will say, ah, but all these people are critics of the government. It's actually quite difficult to find, I have to add, someone um, who would write um, from a strictly embassy point of view, um, unless we'd ask the ambassador to contribute um, an essay. Um, the kind of opinion you get in that book generally reflects uh, a level of scholarly criticism, uh, which unfortunately sometimes, as Mara dismisses, um, out of hand. So, um, but I, 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 I think it's a fine team of contributors, personally. And, and just very quickly on the, the point by, um, that it, it was the war, um, I absolutely agree with you that um, there, there has been some remarkable achievement over the last 15, 20 years inside Eritrea in terms of primary education, for example, which is, which is an, a, an accomplishment that is frequently swept under the carpet by um, outside observers, and that the war undeniably has blown that all away. But I have to add that the, that the outbreak of the war in 1998, re regardless of what you think um, actually started the fighting at Badmei, who came into Badmei first, who fired the first shots. The fact was that the war itself was a foreign policy disaster for the Eritrean government, and they, it was their failure. 
um, Isaias and uh, several others, some of them now in jail, knew that there was trouble brewing with Ethiopia and they should have offset it much earlier. So it's not enough to throw money at schools and build roads. Um, foreign policy was neglected. Um, what happened in May 98 was the outcome of a neglect of foreign policy. Okay, well, I, I thank you very much. That leaves a lot of questions hanging. Unfortunately, uh, we normally la uh, encourage you to hang around and engage, but this room is uh, going to be used again at 11, so I've got to check you out. But you can, you can engage each other in the hallway. Uh, just uh, thank you very much, and let's thank our uh, contributors.